Ford vs. Ferrari is one of my favorite movies that gets almost like everything right. The action, the driving, and Matt Damon playing pretty much anyone is automatically a win in my book, okay? But after a little bit of the big old brain wanting to see just how much of the story was actually real, and maybe what's Shrek DreamWorks real, I decided to take a peek. So I'm Alex, Alex.Martini with two underscores on Instagram, and today we're gonna get into the real story of Ford vs. Ferrari because not everything was exactly perfect. Unlike you, you're perfect. Keep it up. The 1960s were a crazy time. The baby boomers were finally coming to age and they had income that wasn't getting tossed around by the government due to world wars. And outside of the impending Wisconsin winter taking place between Russia and America, most Americans wanted just a few things. Just a couple, nothing too crazy. They wanted to be able to dance. They wanted to go dancing. That was a big deal back then. They wanted to have a nice house. That was another thing, number two, okay? And they wanted to drive some sexy cars, okay? It was shocking how people become more individualistic when the world isn't proverbially ending because of a man with a bad mustache. And as you start to gather more money, you want to start doing more dumb shit. So to respond, Ford came out with what was initially called the Ford Edsel, a 10-year, $350 million investment that Ford managed to mess up so badly due to quality and reliability issues, people opted to go buy a Chrysler or a GM instead. There was really nothing sexy about the Edsel. I'm sorry, like even nowadays, I'm not entirely saying it would be something you put in your driveway. So instead, Lee Lacocca finally convinced the Ford family to invest in something that was a bit different a sports car. Because it's easier to buy versus start one, it didn't take long for Ford to search for a sports car company that was probably gonna sell or get into bankruptcy issues, and what they found was a limping, arrogant company known as Ferrari, to which Ferrari had really not made any fans at all. Like, Ferrari told Lamborghini to stick to making tractors and let Ferrari make sports cars after Ferruccio Lamborghini tried to help him with his clutch issue. Ferrari also fired a massive chunk of his engineering team after they told Enzo that his wife shouldn't be on the engineering shop floor trying to change vehicles and production methods. It was those people can that would go on to build the 350 GT for Lamborghini in only 120 days. The story here is what you know though. Ferrari pulled out of the deal at the last minute due to a clause that Ford put into the agreement that they couldn't negotiate the financial budget of the company, which included the racing program of Ferrari. Now, Ferrari's typical response was go eat it. And this was essentially an ornery man. He said, he would never sell to an ugly company that builds ugly cars in an ugly factory. That's true, okay? Fiat would secure the final deal and the deuce would be a uh, quote unquote big pissed mad. Okay, so the Ferrari killer began, and that's where the history has more details than the movie initially lets on. You see, in the movie, it feels like the car was developed relatively quickly, using Ken Miles' driving experience as a backbone for the car. And with the help of some like quick dynamometer and the ability to swap entire hub assemblies, they won. That's it, done, movie magic. Okay, but there was actually some more serious stuff that took place that led up to this win. Okay, number one, the GT40 was insanely unreliable. Ford built a car that was fast, but the thing couldn't stay alive long enough to win a race, especially stay alive for 24 hours. Number two, they weren't experienced in really making sports cars as a whole. Even the Mustang was years out in development, and what that was compared to what this race car needed to be were absolutely nowhere near the same. You see, endurance racing with longevity is something for Italians, not Americans, at least at the time. And number three, the heating of the car was impossible to solve. The Mulsanne straight would cause the front brake rotors to heat up to over 1500 degrees Fahrenheit in seconds, literally melting the rotor and the remaining hub assembly into like the silver surfer. It was just a huge problem. And Ford tried previous to the movie, like they lost in 1964 and 1965. It wasn't until good old Carroll Shelby came on board to be the last ditched attempt to have the car have a fighting chance. And if Shelby didn't do it right, he was gonna be fired too. But there was also another name that helped make this as possible, Joe Makura, the engineer that is probably most importantly associated with taking a 332 docile low motor into the 427 that would ultimately jump into the AC Cobra in 1965, and from there, a GT40 engine would be burst into this world that had a lot of power, okay, it moistened into the land. And to add ego to the battle, Makura remembers that there was a time after the engine had finished its development, in which Henry II actually went to go boast to his wife, who is known as the Contessa, okay? Christina was her name, who's probably one of the five people that could handle Henry Ford and all his cheeky goodness, and was listening to Henry boast about how he said, quote, I now have the best racing engine in the world. To which she responded pretty point blank back and said, no, you don't, Henry. You can't say you have the best engine in the world until you actually beat Ferrari at Le Mans. 
So the story of Makura is super cool because it was all new. Everything they did was new. See, they learned that by changing the intake valve construction versus the exhaust valves, the engine could take more abuse, going from a 5,900 RPM redline to a 7,000 RPM redline with just one change. Because the engine would shake so much, they had to develop two vertical and horizontal bolts to lock the main bearing cap so the engine didn't shake itself apart. The more it revved, the crazier it got. So every time the engine blew up, there was no way to analyze the remains because it blew up. Pistons would be melted. Cylinder wall damage would look like a Taco Bell toilet. It was terrible how disastrous this engineering actually was at the beginning. And because Makura had so much stress on his plate to ensure that this didn't fail, when the engine was up for its final testing, which was a buff horse 427, the dimometer would not only mimic the Le Mans track of accelerations, braking, g-forces, and more, but the engine was actually tested not for 24 hours straight, not for 36 hours straight, but they tested the engines up to 45 hours straight before being crated to France for the race. Now, you do have the story of people like Phil Remington installing and creating that quick change brake system, which solved the most same straight issue with the heating. He also added 79 horsepower onto the car just by changing the ducting for airflow. McCurr and his team helped build an engine that could travel 3,000 miles at an average speed of 130 miles per hour on an endurance race that Ford was still, by all definitions, a rookie in. Leo Beebe wasn't a villain in real life though. He was just a tough executive because Henry Ford was also a tough executive. And you often found him pushing the teams forward with every inch he could, even when they lost, because Ford did lose like a ton leading up to this. The iconic photo shoot, the controversy of Ken Miles finishing second, and the fact that Ford did it just after two years of brash development is one of the coolest automotive stories out there. But what's even cooler to me is that in Le Mans in 1966, Ferrari would come back and actually win against the GT40s and their new 330p4, only for Ford to return back again another year and demolish them. And in 2017, Ford did it again. 50 years after the car won the 1966 24 hour of Le Mans, Ford returned with the Ford GT to win the race for its GT class, which is kind of cool when you think about it. A little bit of a flex. The same year Edsel Ford told the world that Ford was on full assault was the same year that Ford would introduce four new cars racing in all unique classes, which dominated after it got the kinks worked out just like six years ago. So say what you will, there is some really cool history in the domestic muscle car world. But what do you care? I get excited, but let me know below. I'm Alex, Alex Martini with two underscores on Instagram. Instagram, and we'll see you later. Adios.